and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Before we start this podcast, I want to warn you that this episode contains some very difficult themes, including discussion about depression and suicidal thoughts. If you feel uncomfortable hearing about any of those subjects, please press stop now and listen to another episode. Remember, if you need to speak to someone, the Samaritans offer support 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Visit samaritans.org for more information. Today's guest is a former Big Brother housemate. I just remember those times with such fondness of watching it. She is the host of the podcast, Maybe Baby, and the host, the woman in charge of Drive Time on Virgin Radio. She's also mum to a little girl, a little one-year-old called Noah. It's Kate Lawler. Hi. Hi. <laughs> thank you for having me. And thank you for looking after the radio show while I was on maternity leave. Uh, <laughs> I absolutely love that. I've got to say, I loved how Virgin did it. So for those who don't know, there was a collection of women who basically came together and and took little stints of, of hosting Drive Time. It was really great that they did that. I liked the fact that it was all women and I liked the fact that they gave all the women flexibility on when they wanted to do the shifts as well. So let's talk about you. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Beckenham in Kent. So oh, it's yeah. borders, it's borderline South East London, borderline yep. Kent, because it's not proper Canterbury, Dover, Kent, but it's on the border of like Penge, Crystal Palace. Yeah, it feels you know more I mean, London. London. Yeah. yeah, it's Greater London. Yeah. If you look at the map, it's Greater London. <laughs> but the postcode is like Beckenham, Kent. So Beckenham is a little town near Bromley. A lot of people might know Bromley. And yeah, I grew up there. My mum and dad moved into the house that I grew up in. Literally, my mum went into hospital to have my twin sister and I. Yeah. And when she went into hospital, they were living in a masonette in Sydenham with my big sister, Kelly. And then when she came out of hospital, she moved into the house. <laughs> Yeah, my dad had moved in and sort of started to decorate it, and they and then they stay and they're still living there now. And that's oh the my house we gosh, got. yeah. And you're a twin as well. I'm a twin. Yeah, I've got a twin sister called Karen. We are fraternal twins. We are non-identical. Right. So we're about as similar as me and my brother, and you know, genetically, like yeah. we haven't got you know, and we don't look anything alike either. She's super tall. At school, she went through puberty like four years before me. So she had these big <laughs> boobs and I just so flat chested. And we always said that she got the boobs and I got the bum. But we are completely different in our, like in what we like. Our personalities and our mannerisms are the same. Yeah. But um, she's very much, she wanted kids from a very young age. She's got two boys. They're like 13 and eight now. Oh, wow. And yeah, she's done it. And she always wanted to be a mum. Yeah. Whereas I was like, oh God, no, can't think of anything worse. And I, I used to, you know, you do the kids. I'm not going to do that. I watched her give birth as well, actually. That was really pretty horrific. Yeah, she with her first. And I remember being in the hospital watching. I was head end. I was like, I'm not going to go down there and look. But right. then I did because he was stuck and he was almost going to have to be like pulled out with the Vontuse. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and in the end, um, is it the forceps? They, they just yeah. had to cut her and I watched that. Maybe that's why I had such a huge fear of childbirth because I watched that and was like, <gasps> if that's what happens to my vagina, I'm definitely not going there. So, <laughs> Well, had you already in your head at that point kind of thought, I don't want kids, yeah. I, that's not, and that kind of cemented, cemented deal for you. <laughs> yeah, cemented yeah. my decision. When you spoke about, so when you started recording Maybe Baby, you spoke a lot about the fact that actually having children is a choice. Mm. And so often women are it's kind of like the leading thing so when are you going to have kids mm. when are you going to do this what about the if like what about i yeah. might not want them of course i think times are changing now yeah but there is just such a common i don't know like presumption that everybody will have children yeah and more often than not women are on fertility journeys so it's an awkward question to be asked mm -hmm. or you know they just don't actually want them and I remember before I had Noah and I was firmly on the, this was before I even started thinking about it, firmly on the child-free, happily child-free fence. I remember somebody saying, why don't you want children? And I just turned around and said, why do you want children? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, now I obviously had Noah and I love her to pieces and I would, I can see why people have children. But yeah. before I was like, what a rude question, like to say, ask me why. Like, I don't need to justify my reason. It's not for me. Yeah. And um, I also think that, conversations around how you know parenthood can really be which is why I'm I guess I'm so brutally honest at times are really important I think it's more harmful not to have conversations about how hard it can be so that women and men can really think about whether they want to have children and whether they're equipped to have children 
Yeah. Because I've really struggled. And yeah. if I've struggled, I know there'll be other people that have struggled and maybe thought to themselves, wow, if I'd have known it was going to be like this or if I'd have known it would be this expensive or if I'd have known it would be this time consuming or mentally draining, physically exhausting, perhaps I wouldn't have, you know. Mm. But like more often than not, we are told it's the most amazing thing ever and it completes you and all that. Um but there's so much else yeah. around that. You know, I, th I think for a long time, like you're saying, all we were told was that it was the most amazing thing. Yeah. But actually that amazingness happens in those split seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's those so things right. that kind of you grasp onto yeah. because that's a great moment. Mm -hmm. And actually there's so much mess that happens around that that, you know, you're completely alone for as well. You know, yeah. you have to deal with that. You have to sort that situation out. Yeah, there's 24 hours in a day and one yeah. little smiling shot on Instagram doesn't, Honestly, it's a whole picture. <laughs> it does not paint that. It's a highlights reel and it doesn't paint the whole picture. Yeah. A lot of people have said to me in the past, but you don't know real love until you've had a child. And that's what we're here for. And it's such a fulfilling thing to have a baby and you, it completes you. It gives you a purpose. And I honestly couldn't disagree with that more. Like definitely, yeah, yeah. I can see why those people were saying those things because they clearly did believe them. But I had... I was living such a fulfilled and happy life before Noah came along and I didn't feel like I needed a purpose. I thought my yeah. purpose in life was, you know, just to be mum to Baxter and Shirley and to be a good partner to Bodge and be a good daughter to my parents and go yeah. out into the world and win Big Brother and, I don't know, just do whatever I'm doing now. I never once thought to myself, you know, there's a reason I've been put on planet Earth. I know I've got a vagina and I know I have boobs and I've got all the parts inside me that can physically have and biologically make a baby. But it yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that I will want one, you know? And, yeah. yeah. Well, when you met Bodge, was that a conversation that came up quite quickly? <laughs> yeah, on our first date, he thought I was, <laughs> he thought I was nuts. He was like... We literally just, you know, we're just sitting here having a cocktail, like calm down. Because I was like, I just want to lay my cards on the table, bud. This is just a bit of fun. You know, I, I'm not interested in kids or marriage. And he was like, whoa. I mean, I thought this was just a bit of fun as well. I was like, just, you know, I just thought it's important to tell you that marriage and kids is not for me, but we'll have fun. And I've just come out of a really long-term relationship. So this is just fun. And for a while, it was just that. He lived in London. I lived in Manchester. We did long distance for two years. And it was yeah. great. It actually was what I needed long distance after the relationship that I'd had, which was very intense. And I guess with that, you get your own independence as well. Yeah. So that you've got that person that you can call, mm -hmm. but also, you know. Yeah. And your time together is more precious, I think, when it's long distance. <sighs> it definitely was. You know, we had like so many lovely weekends in Manchester or London where we hadn't seen each other for two or three weeks because of work or whatever. So yeah, it forced us to do that. But then that conversation at the beginning, at the very first date, over the years, and it was it was a good seven to eight years of awkward and uncomfortable conversations every time really? a new year rolled around because I'd always say to him, ask me next year, I'll be ready next year. I, I'm sure Would he I ask you and you say that? Oh, or would you gosh. just put it out there? He'd, he'd give it go... a week. Yeah, he'd give it a week after New Year because on New Year's Eve we'd get totally trashed and then there'd be a huge come down. So he'd give it a couple of weeks so that I wouldn't be in a really dark, <laughs> dark, <laughs> you know, dark period. He'd be like, right, give it a few weeks. And then like mid January, around his birthday, yeah. he'd say, so what, you know, you were saying, he'd always do it. He'd be like, so what about now? What about this year then? New Year, New Horizons, new, what about new little member of our family and I'd say what another dog yeah okay go on then we'll have another dog and we we'd end up adopting Shirley but he would always ask for some hope and that in turn then made me feel terribly guilty because yeah. I but then I also felt like hang on a second I did lay my cards out on the table yeah. but then he was like but that was we'd only just met he was like you know when you've been with somebody for a long time and you're in love with them surely that's the next step and I was like, well, yes, that's what society tells us, that you meet somebody, you get married and you have children. But yeah. I'm not conforming to what society tells me to do. I just want to do what I want to do. I've got to do what makes me happy. But yeah. then I wanted to do what makes him happy as well because I love him and I knew mm. he'd be a great dad. And I guess I used to say to my friends, if I'm ever going to have kids, it's going to be with him because he's just everything that I would want my partner to be if I would have yeah. a child with them. So maybe, you know, it was just me meeting the right person. That was what it, all it was you know, yeah. for so many years, and I finally did. But, yeah, those uncomfortable conversations, they turned into arguments sometimes. You yeah, know, it must have... have been a real bone of contention between you. There really was, yeah. And I used to think, he's going to leave me because he really? really wants to have children. And he used to say, I'm not going to leave you. And when he proposed to me, we weren't even, you know, 
he proposed to me at a time when you know it still was very much I wasn't even on the fence I was in the child free and happy camp and yeah he proposed to me and I said are you so you're asking me to marry you and then I started thinking are you asking me to marry you because you think by doing this I'll have your baby or are you asking me to marry you because you love me no matter what and he was like, I can't believe you're even asking me that. Like, of course I love you no matter what. That's why I'm asking you. And I want to marry you regardless of whether we have children or not. And yeah, I'd like to think that he would still, you know, stick to his word. But who knows, like 10 years down the line, he also, might... Also, I love the fact that he's just proposed to you and rather yeah, than know, saying what, a yes or a no, it's, it's a conversation. Stop it. Stop <laughs> Let's it. debate this a little. Can we just clarify <laughs> a few points before I say yes? <laughs> he's holding the ring like, you know you're really killing the vibe? You're, ru <laughs> you're ruining this romantic moment for everyone. Do you know what? I'm just going to take the ring back. <laughs> Screw you, Kate. I but know. you are such a talker, though, and you're I a am. thinker. So, you know, to, your brain will be firing off all these things. And I think it's so great that you vocalise that because so many women will be feeling these things and not put it out there. Mm. Even though I didn't want children when I, after about seven years, I said, you know, we're in a unique position here where I don't want children, and you do. More often than not, it's the other way around. But we did the podcast because we wanted to just kind of really get a true insight and speak to people in depth about what their experience of parenthood was like. And after every episode with a parent, I'd come away thinking, actually, it sounds all right. It sounds fun. Because <laughs> everyone would be going, it's great, you got to do it, Kate. <laughs> and then I turned 40 and that really hit something. It struck a chord. Really? I honestly, overnight, overnight, gee, I was... I was just in my 30s because my, yeah. my 20s were hedonistic. They were wild. I was going out, I was having all the fun. And then in my 30s, I felt like I just wanted to relax a little bit more. And it was more like I'd have the odd glass of wine on a Sunday down the pub with my roast dinner. And then I, and then I got Baxter and I was a dog mum and I really enjoyed still working, still focusing on my career. But then I don't know why, but as soon as I hit 40, I said, well, what's this decade got for me? Like, what do I do in this decade? I, I, I looked at it very much like... 20s were wild 30s were finding the man of my dreams and settling down and yeah. what does I don't know it just really it made me think a lot overnight also, I guess at 40 you know that that window of possibility it is close so at some point that choice is no longer going to be a choice mm -hmm. you know you have then that's fi that's final at that yeah. at some point we run out of eggs eventually but if they yeah. were infinite I wonder how long I would have put it off for <laughs> probably yeah, would have yeah. been having a baby in the 60s no I wouldn't have <laughs> waited that long but um but it's yeah it's interesting I already knew that my time was running out because we'd been to a fertility clinic for a health check and right. while Bodge's sperm was you know he was proper puffed up chest at that point she said well done your sperm are good they're swimming in the right direction they're very fast he was like great such a bloke about it I <laughs> was I was told that my ultrasound scan was fine everything was normal but my blood test the AMH blood test came back with the indi it basically indicated that I would go through the menopause early that I might go through the menopause early and that my egg count was very low for my right. age like in the bottom five percent so I didn't have a lot of time left and I knew that in 2019 we, we were told that in 2019 right. um, while we did series one of maybe baby and even hearing that I, it was a shock because I realized like you said it would no longer be a choice it wouldn't be my decision to make mm -hmm. one day very soon I won't be able to have children and that's that and you know, the woman was really lovely, Mari Wren, at the Lister Fertility Clinic. She said, when are you getting married? And we said, June 2020. And she said, I said, we're going to start trying. We're going we're to start trying after that. And she said, well, would it be the worst thing to walk down the aisle pregnant? I think she, she really wanted me to get on with it. And yeah. I was like, yeah, do you know what? I don't want to be pregnant on my wedding day, babe. <laughs> I want to get drunk. <laughs> I want to have fun. And she was like, just don't put it on the back burner for too long. So right. the plan was to start trying after we got married in June 2020. But... We were like, yeah, we're going to try on our honeymoon. And then COVID bloody hit and our wedding got cancelled. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my word, we've got to wait another year. And then he was like, well, shall we wait another year? Or should we just, instead of getting married, should we just try for a baby? And I, so that was like, oh, my goodness. This, like, this whole baby thing is just, it was crazy. And I literally, by the middle of May, like literally two weeks after my 40th, we decided that we were going to try for a baby instead of getting married and get married in 2021 instead. Yeah which we never ended up doing because of COVID was still around. Thank goodness, because I just wouldn't, but no, I wasn't in any fit state to do it. <laughs> but we decided, literally, it was like, a two, it was a week of intense two-week conversations. We were like, are we doing this? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And did it all and, happen and quite then, quickly? Yeah. <laughs> we were very fortunate. <laughs> I mean, After worrying as well about how long right? it's going to take, is it going to happen? 
I know. The thing is, I was using Glow, the ovulation tracker, so you Uh know when you're ovulating. I was using it for years to not get pregnant because I wasn't on the pill. So I was using it. I was like, I'm ovulating here. And there there was like a couple of days where it was really safe to have unprotected sex. I was like, come on, that's, you know, it's safe now. (laughs) So I knew when I was ovulating for years. So it was like I kind of, and also I got a pain when I ovulated, which actually is quite good if you're trying because then you know. So I said to him, like, the end of May is when I'm next ovulating. We had the conversations in May and I said, at the end of May, I will be ovulating. Let's try then. And I remember us trying when my app said I was most fertile. But the next evening, I started to get the pain. And I was like, we're going to have to go again, bud, because tonight's the night. (laughs) And so I knew it was one of those days. But I immediately felt after that weekend that I don't know why. I just felt like it had worked. I just felt, I was like, I just got to have this feeling that you've impregnated me. I really do, especially because we did it twice and it was when I was ovulating and I got the pain and I knew my cycle so well from those years of tracking it. Yeah, um, yeah. That, yeah, I just knew. So I found out really early on that I was pregnant. How did that feel? I was, I was, over, I was over the moon. I was so happy. And I never thought seeing a positive pregnancy test would bring me so much joy. And I immediately felt maternal, which I'd never... You know, everyone says I was so maternal with the dogs, but like it's a different kind of maternal feeling when you know that there's a baby inside you. Mm. And I was straight away completely in love with with what it was. I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm so happy that we've we've done it and we've made it work. And now yeah. now it's just the next nine months that we have to get through. Like, who knows if it will you know, be a viable pregnancy? Who knows if, if I'll be OK? Who knows what the pregnancy will be like? Um, who knows what the birth is going to be like? I was always worried about every every aspect. That's the thing, isn't it? You get a positive test and there's that moment of elation. And I, I kind of feel like there's nothing to describe. There's nothing quite like mm. seeing that positive, I think. There's a, it's a very odd feeling, whether you are expecting it or not, I would say. Mm. Um, but, yeah, there's just nothing quite like it. Then all of a sudden, all this uncertainty and doubt and panic yeah. just starts creeping Did in you at have you. That? Did yeah, you? absolutely. Well, because I had I had a miscarriage before I had Buzz for my pr- first pregnancy, actually. So each oh pregnancy God. after that was I, that I had that over like just I was just aware. I think the innocence of pregnancy by that point had disappeared. Mm-hmm. I just knew that actually this is just the start. That word pregnant, and actually there's there's other hurdles to to overcome. Yeah, so many. And I was really fortunate actually to have a very good pregnancy. I was overwhelmingly healthy and I enjoyed it and I, I I really embraced my body changing and I I was fascinated with what happened to me, like physically. Because you, you hear about, you know, morning sickness and stuff, but like the I had like veins coming up on my eyelids and my areolas went huge. <laughs> Bodge's yeah. nickname for me was Big Discs because he basically <laughs> thought my areola looked like <laughs> mini discs. <laughs> and just it's crazy isn't it what happens to you like well you think like things like that are so fascinating because it's yeah. literally it connects you to your ba- your, your baby straight yeah. away because it, yeah. you know it helps them find your boob when when yeah. it's time for them to feed you know it's yeah. it's like your body is already thinking ahead to the baby actually being in the room yeah it's just remarkable what happens to your body during pregnancy and yeah everything that happens afterwards, like how how your body changes as well once you've given birth and it just recovers and goes back to, I mean, it never goes back to what it was. For some women it does, they're very lucky. But yeah, um, yeah I look at my, I was looking at my scar the other day because I had an abdominal birth and I was thinking, how on earth did they pull her out of that? That is the tiniest little incision. I mean, but you, you forget how small they were at yeah. one point as well because she's huge now. She just had her one year checkup at the uh, health visitor and she's in the 98th centile. <laughs> She's oh such gosh. a chunk. She was the like twenty fifth when she was born, and I'm blaming Sue. I'm blaming the mother in law because all she does is give her rice cakes with a mountain of cream cheese on. She's every day. I'm like, she... but every time she take a bite, she just pours more cream cheese. I'm like, Sue, enough cream cheese already. No wonder she's so big. So, did you know you were going in for a C section? I did. Yes. So I'd spent many years not wanting children and also having a huge fear of childbirth. Um, well, having been there with your sister. Yeah, thanks, Karen. And I went to my GP before we started trying and said, look, I'm really scared of trying for a baby because I'm terrified of childbirth. I, mm. The thought of pushing something out of my tuppence breaks me out in a cold sweat. Like, I, I fear that I'm going to die or that my baby's going to die or we're both going to die. I fear, like, it's all going to go wrong and I'll have to end up having an emergency C-section like my mum did with her first. And 
I'm shaped, I'm built like my mum. Her pelvis was too small. So it was, it was real, there was real complications there. So that's why she ended up having an emergency C-section with Kelly, my big sister. And I just had this huge fear of childbirth. And the GP said, look, you are allowed to ask for an elective C-section if you really want one. And yeah. you can go through, you can chat to an obstetrician, they can go through everything with you. And so I did that. And I had like quite a few conversations with obstetricians before I tried for a baby and then when I was pregnant and then we decided yeah that a c-section would be the best decision and I nearly had a c-section anyway because my placenta was really high uh-huh or was it low I can't remember which way it goes low so was it covering that's the, it yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, then yeah. they said you might have to have one anyway but it moved up in the end and right. so they said you know it's your choice but given that you have a fear of childbirth and you really want to go for the elective c-section let's do it and I I, I think it's really important that I, I just feel grateful that we, you know we live in, we live somewhere where we can have that choice yeah. and we can have the birth we want. Yeah, yeah. And what was it like when you met Noah? Did you know she was going to be a girl? I did. Yeah, from right. the very first scan we had, actually, I opted for that blood test, which told, I just yeah. I couldn't wait, and I was convinced I was having a boy because both my sisters had two boys, oh, and yeah, my little course. and my little brother had a girl, and I was like, well, I'll have a boy because all the girls have had boys, <laughs> and my brothers had a little girl, and so yeah, when she told me I was having a girl, I was really surprised, and I'd also convinced Bod she was having a son. <laughs> I was like, you know it's going to be a boy, don't you? So he was like, oh, it's a girl. Oh, and I was like, are you disappointed? And he was like, no. And I just really thought I was having his son. So I knew it was a girl. And when she came out, it was just, wow. Just, I mean, the, the one downside of having the C-section was that the screen is so high up, right below my boobs. So she was placed in a position that felt like I just like I was holding a telephone. So she was she was up, <laughs> up. So I went, I can't see her. What does she look like? I can't see her. She was on me straight away for skin yeah. on skin. But I, I was like, I really want to be able to see her and I just can't because of the screen. And Bodge was like, she looks like a cabbage. And I always remember her saying <laughs> that. And she was a little bit of a mess when she came out, like all babies are. But I just, oh, the love. Yeah, it was a magical feeling. And I just didn't Did want to- Did it hit to... you straight away? Oh, straight away. Yeah, I was completely in love. And- crying my eyes out and it's the first time I think I'd seen Bodge cry in years uh, we were both over the moon that she was there and she was healthy and it had just gone really well you know they were sewing me back up and we had the playlist on and she was on me making these little noises and straight away I was like I love you so much and I never wanted to lose her so yeah and what was it like bringing her home well we'd had quite a it wasn't a straightforward birth. Oh, no, it wasn't, Bringing was her it? home. Yeah, we yeah. had quite a tough... We, we were literally wheeled into the recovery room and I started to breastfeed straight away, which was wonderful and I thought everything was okay until the midwife came over and said, I'm not quite happy with those noises she's making because she sounds like she's singing. And sometimes when babies are born via a C-section, the fluid isn't drained properly from their lungs mm. where they're not pushed out of the yeah. you know birth canal. So I just want to check with somebody else, get a, next, a second opinion. And then they decided they were going to take her to intensive care, which was just a real shock because she was on me and she was feeding and I thought everything was okay. So she was taken away about two hours after I'd given birth, an hour right. after I'd given birth. And I went back up to the postnatal ward with no baby and she was in intensive care and I was just like oh bummer this is not how I expected it to be and I knew I, I felt like she wasn't in grave danger like I knew it was probably going to be okay but when they're in intense when a, a, your baby is in intensive care yeah. you can't help but worry and yeah it's obviously like you, you, you have them inside you for so long, you think as soon as you give birth, they're going to be on you and you're just going to be on the ward. And all the other mums were there with their babies. And I was just like, oh, I just want to know that she's okay. And I couldn't even go and see her because I couldn't get out of bed because I'd had... Yeah, because you've had yeah, your C-section. and I had the yeah. catheter in. And so Bodge was with her. So then I was on my own and I was I wanted him to go with her, but then I just felt deeply lonely and I was thinking to myself... Well, I just, I want Bodge here, but I wanted him there with her, you know? Yeah. And uh, so she was in intensive care for a couple of days. And then after coming out of intensive care, we had to stay in hospital for two more days because she lost so much weight. Right. From, yeah, she, I mean, they all lose a lot of, they all lose a bit of their birth weight, but she'd gone over the percentage that was healthy. So they said, like, you've got to stay in hospital until she can gain some more weight. Otherwise, if you have a, if you go home now and you have a visit from the health visitor tomorrow and she hasn't put on enough weight, you'll have to come back, but via A&E. Right. And I just thought to myself, I don't know if I want to do that. So by this point, had they <clears> made you, had you been discharged 
No. Or did they keep you, you yeah, in they, as well? They kept me in nice. because Noah was in intensive care and I was breastfeeding. So yeah. I was, they want their, I thought I was on call. So yeah, I was in my yeah, bed yeah. and then I was allowed to go and visit her. I wasn't allowed to stay with her all the time. But when she was needed feeding, they would call me and I'd go and feed her and then come back. Yeah. It was only for a couple of days. And then I was moved to my own room with her rather than be on a ward because, yeah. well, I was moved to a room when I didn't have her because this midwife said to me, look, you may as well not be on this ward because you can get some sleep in a room. Noah's in intensive care. You're not going to get any sleep on this ward with all the babies and the mum. So I was moved to the room, uh, private room, which was lovely because I got some sleep. I got some sleep the first night-ish. I, I went back to feed her a couple of times. But after the second day of her being in the hosp in intensive care, she was moved sort of from 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 the real intensive care. I can't remember what it's called now. The name escapes me. But it was like from NICU to like... The ward where there it's still intensive care, but it's less serious. Okay. So she was there for a day. So it was one day in intensive care, one day in there, and then two days back in the room with me while she put on weight. And then we were told to stay in hospital for one more day just because she still hadn't put on weight, but we wanted to go home. So we just chanced yeah. it. And they said, you'll have a visit tomorrow from the health visitor. And if she hasn't put on enough weight, you will have to come back again. Really? So we, I just fed and fed and fed. And thankfully she'd put on enough weight that we were able to stay at home. Mm -hmm. So when we finally got home, it was a bit like, thank goodness, it's been five days in hospital. I was so happy to get in my own bed. Yeah. And, you know, Bod had been trying to sleep on this uncomfortable red leather chair in the room. And I just wanted, you know, I wanted to see the dogs. I wanted some like nice food that wasn't hospital food. We <laughs> ordered like five guys, I think. And we had like a vegan burger and French fries with mayo and ketchup. And it was just nice to sit on the sofa and just look at her in our arms yeah. and just, you know, start the journey of what, you know, of her being at home with us. So well, also, I guess if, if she'd been in intensive care and had all, had all that, those other people having their input, it's quite nice to just kind of go, and now it's, it's us. Just us, yeah. Because there was a lot of, there were so many visits from, you know, in hospital, from midwives, you know, coming in. And actually, that was one benefit, I think, from staying in hospital for the five days I did was that I had so much help from midwives um, with latching and positioning with breastfeeding. And they taught me how to swaddle her properly and how to it was it was really nice. It was like a crash course in, you know, breastfeeding and everything like that. But um, you're right. It was finally just Bodge, myself and Noah. And that first night it was just so calm and quiet and peaceful. And it was, you know, nice that she wasn't having to have any more antibiotics given to her or you know, people just coming in and out. The first six weeks for you were quite a ride. Yeah, I imagine, I imagine they are with all new mums, right? Like, well, they are. They absolutely are. I can remember phoning you and and you know <laughs> and just dropping you texts every now and then just to let you know that I was thinking of you because you had to go back in as yeah. well because of a nail infection. Yeah, yeah, and I'll that I'll, I'll never forget that. Thank you so much. It really meant the world to me to know that you were there and so like so many people reached out on Instagram mm. um, and all my friends and family were all reaching out to me as well because I couldn't see anybody because it was locked down and yeah. you could only see people who were part of your bubble so that meant my family couldn't come over because they already had their bubbles so it really meant a lot for everybody reaching out on social media but yeah we had quite a few A&E visits after we'd brought her home after five days we went back because she had paronychia in the finger it's quite rare in newborns but two but, of mine have had it, like I said oh, to you. Just, so we were yeah. back in, we were in A and E and on the children's ward, you know. Yeah, and it's it's always it just when you go into A and E, it's never a nice feeling because you are in, you know, that's where people rush their children when something seriously is wrong with them, and you see so many babies there who are really, really ill. So you're like, like when I look back now, at the time it was a monumental illness. I was like, she's going to mm -hmm. die, she's going to die. And I look back now and I'm so grateful that it wasn't anything too serious. I mean, it could have got serious, but we got there just in time. Yeah. And then the next time we went back, they thought she might have sepsis or meningitis and they had to do the lumbar puncture and they wouldn't let us be there. And they asked us to go and have a walk outside the hospital grounds. And I remember it being just this cold really freezing cold like February night and it was pitch black and you know we were walking around the hospital and I was just like is she even meant to be here Bodge like we had the problems when she was born then she, we had to go back we had to go back because she raised the temp she spiked the temperature four days after we got back from hospital right. and we rung 111 and they advised us to go to A&E in the end, it was okay, but she did spike a temperature. They just told us to keep an eye on her. But then we went back to pa for paronychia. Then we went back and, you know, it was the suspected sepsis or meningitis. And I was just like, what's going on? Like, is is, is something bad going to happen eventually? Is she meant to be taken away from us? Like, I couldn't help but thinking that she might not, she might not 
I don't know, make it or it was it was inevitable that she was going to be taken away from us. It just I couldn't help but feel that she wasn't meant to be. Yeah. And Bodge was crying and I was crying. But thankfully after, you know, staying in hospital for another night and then she was on the IV antibiotics for a week. So we kept having to go back to hospital every day for five days, I think it was, to have mm-hmm. the antibiotics administered. So there's just a lot of hospital visits. And I felt like that newborn bubble that everyone talks about, it never happened for us. Yeah. And I'm sure it doesn't happen for everybody either. Yeah. And it must be amazing when it does. But I was like, you know, half tempted to call my book, what fucking newborn bubble? Because we didn't get it. <laughs> and I was, I was really gutted because I was, I was hoping that it was going to be that kind of, you know, you, you give birth and you go home and it's just you three and family visit, but yeah. we never got that. Yeah. But I have to be grateful, you know, that obviously I'm always thinking to myself how lucky we are that we have a national health service who look after our babies and who are so... Just they were there, like every time we went in, they were so lovely and just on it and just looked after Noah so well. And I just, I'm forever grateful for them and grateful that she's she was she was always discharged and she was fine mm. and we didn't have any serious compli- health complications or illnesses, you know, like so many parents have to deal with. How were you during that time? Because obviously there is now a huge focus on maternal mental health. <clears throat> and, and when things like that are going on, mm. you know, it, it's your emotions are all over the shop yeah I was I was probably dealing with it a lot worse than Bodge I think he was trying to be brave because he saw how broken I was that we weren't having an easy time of it and I was having to go with her to the hospital and you know I mean, he drove me to the hospital every time I had to go and have the antibiotics. But then because of all the antibiotics she had, she then developed reflux, terrible reflux, like projectile vomiting everywhere. And so that was a really tough experience to deal with, as well as breastfeeding then became an issue. And she had tongue tie as well. And it was all these things. And I think I just presumed that's what it was. I presume that's what parents go through when their babies are so young. They go through all these things because you meet lactation consultants and you meet tongue tie specialists and they're there for a reason you think well you're you must be dealing with this every day so other parents must be going through this but I internalized a lot of my emotions and I I can't say I regret doing that now because I just did it at the time because I didn't want to feel like I was being dramatic I felt like I was being dramatic saying that I felt so I mean I did feel suicidal but not until around six weeks but I really thought it was just a case of the baby blues and that it was just, you know, we were just going through a bit of a tough time. But when I had therapy, my therapist kind of spoke to me about processing and, you know, at the point when Noah seemed to be getting better after all the A&E trips, after we'd started to get the reflux, you know, the reflux was reducing and the breastfeeding, we started to combi feed, which gave me a break and stuff like that. I was able to process a lot more what happened, which is probably why yeah. I started to spiral because I had more time to think about it. Whereas well, when, the pressure in the moment, is almost off there yeah. as well. So you're no longer having to function and be the, mm. you be the mum for everyone, actually, yeah. and be the wife, like, be the partner. All of a sudden now mm. the pressure's off and you can actually start to process it. Yeah. Yeah, and I did. And I did spiral and I did... I didn't see enough of my family or friends for them to kind of, like talk to me about what I was probably really feeling and I think if I'd have seen more people they would have been like Kate you need help whereas I was like I'm fine I'm fine and I didn't want to talk to Bodge about it either even though he's he's big on talking he's big on communication he wants to talk to me about how I'm feeling but I just felt like I had to be strong like I had to do everything myself and be mum to Noah and not be struggling because I think because I, I think with everything I've ever done in my life I've always taken to most things in life, like a duck to water. Like, I know that sounds a bit braggy. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds a bit braggy, but you know, like if I had a task at home, I'd just be like, right, I can do this. Or if yeah. I started a new job, they'd be like, do you need to help? I'd be like, no, I, I can crack this. I can do it. You know, I always wanted to, you know, training for a marathon. I'd be like, I train for a marathon. I, I can do this. I can do everything I put my, you know, hand to. But I think with motherhood, I felt like I could do it, but I really couldn't. And I was gutted that I wasn't finding it a breeze or it didn't come naturally to me. And I wasn't finding breastfeeding, even though I did at the beginning find it just so wonderful. And I felt so close to her and I was struggling with that as well, which I think can send you into such turmoil. Because breastfeeding is like, everyone tells you how hard breastfeeding is, but Mm. no one told me how hard it is to stop. 
even when you're you you should stop because it's not working it's really difficult because you're you feel such a bond with your baby when you're breastfeeding and the closeness of it and you know it's so you know you're nourishing them from you and it's like wow I can't believe I'm giving my baby milk this is insane my boobs are providing this food for my child but then the feelings of resentment and like I felt so I felt so upset that she she didn't want my boobs in that way like I was so upset and I felt rejected and I felt frustration because she couldn't get the hang of it properly and I couldn't get the hang of it properly and so that really sent me into a spiral as well I think that contributed greatly to how I was feeling and it's everything it just all comes together doesn't it it's a mashup of everything that comes together to make you feel the way you do I think Mm. also sleep because at that time you're not you know you're not sleeping properly and then you know you've got this whole feeling and the the reflux as well there's just I think it's just layer upon layer upon layer I know and it's the ultimate paradox isn't it parenting because the day-to-day experience of looking after a newborn Mm. is so mundane it was so mundane for me and monotonous and challenging and exhausting and but then it was the most joyful thing ever because I was she would then smile at me for the first time and I would feel like just this rush of endorphins like I was so happy when she smiled at me for the first time and it was like you said it was that moment those little moments where you feel so happy but then most of the time I did feel really really down and worried that she was losing weight and anxious about you know, anyone else looking after her while I slept or, you know, like stressed because the house was a mess. And just, it is just such a complex set of emotions when they're a newborn. And that on top of sleep deprivation is just wild. I was hallucinating most days. I was saying stuff to Bodge. He was like, what? What did you just say? And then I'd say, I don't know. What did I just say? Did I just, did I really just say that? And he'd be like, yeah, you did just go to sleep you need to go and have a nap and I would be like yeah okay I'll go and have a nap and then I'd lay in bed and I couldn't sleep so I'd put a wash on or I'd go and do you know because your mind though because I think when you're a doer as well you're so used to getting everything done yeah so when you see a pile of you see the laundry (laughs) baskets full you want you there's something in us that stops us from kind of going no actually it's okay if all that stuff isn't done Mm. we're focusing on something else we've recalibrated in this different way but actually the, the other part of your brain has always functioned in that way refuses to stop yeah you're so right when you're a doer. It's so easy. It's so easy to say to to a mum to be, just do yourself a favour. Sleep when the baby sleeps and don't worry yeah. about the mess in the house. It's so easy to say that. But yeah. like if you're a doer and you don't like mess, it's actually it's worse in a way because you're you're laying there and you're like, I can't sleep. This, you know, all the dishes haven't been done. And I yes. there's and everyone buys you flowers as well. And you're like, I can barely keep my baby alive. How am I die. how am I supposed to keep all these flowers alive as well? <laughs> I feel really bad because they're gifts and I should be watering them. But ah, I'm I have a baby hanging off my boob and there's laundry to be done and <laughs> oh my word. It is just yeah, it's exhausting. The sleep is just it's next level tiredness. I can't yeah. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of women who are saying to me when I was pregnant, just wait till the baby comes if you think you sleep. Because I was kept on on stories going, I can't blimmin' sleep. This bump is getting ridiculous, and I need a wee all the time, and I keep getting leg cramps in the middle of the night. And I'm sure I'm going to sleep better when the baby's here. And everyone was like, "You are a joker!" Like, no, you're not. This is good <laughs> sleep compared to. And I was like, no. And one person messaged me saying, "Don't let everyone scare you." I actually slept better once the baby came than when I did when I was pregnant. And I hung on to that. I hung I was like, yes, yes, I'm going to sleep better. No, I didn't. Thanks for lulling me into a false sense of security. I definitely didn't. Oh, um, but it does get better. Yeah. And they do end up sleeping. They do. But it just takes time. And when you're in the thick of it and you're in the throes of it and you're thinking, I'm never going to be happy again. What have I done? Why did we do this? I knew I'd be a bad mum. I knew I wouldn't cope well. This is why I didn't want a child. And all those horrible feelings are going through your head in those first six weeks, six to 12 weeks, especially. You're, and someone says to you, just get through the first six months. And they mean yeah. it They mean it really well, just get yeah. through the first six months. But when you can't even think about getting through the next six hours, yeah. it's like the worst yeah. thing you can hear. You're like, how? How am I supposed to get through? The, how See, am I, supposed I can remember to get someone through? saying about two weeks And me kind of feeling like, well, that feels like a chunk of time. Like, let's just push through, push through. And actually, it was months. 
but it was having that little bit of a time frame to know that it wasn't going to be mm. the forever, yeah. to know that things will change mm. and the sun will shine again. And, yeah. you know, these feelings that take over, like those those voices in your head that kind of go, no, no good at this, shouldn't have done this, especially at night time mm -hmm. when, you know, the world is asleep and you are there with a baby who's crying in your face and you've got... Yeah. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah. It literally, for me, it felt like I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Oh, God, those night times. Yeah. Especially. And you know that the thing is, you have so many people around you, like family and friends. I mean, you might not, but like I had family around me, friends around me. I had, you know, an army of women who were there the moment I opened that Instagram app, yeah. you know, saying I'm part of the Wide Awake Club too. But I never felt more alone than those night feeds when I'd yeah. be sitting there trying to wind her because winding takes fucking ages i no one told me how long winding took i was oh, it like depends oh, on the baby the as two well hour cycle yeah yes. i mean <laughs> the two hour cycle i thought oh i feed them and then i wind her and then it's two hours until the next feed but i'd be feeding her which would take an hour and then it would be an hour to wind and then i'd, I'd need to feed her again yeah. i was like how is this <laughs> exactly no, it's not two exactly. hour cycle <laughs> <laughs> and oh, but you do your thoughts run away with you at night. Yeah, that's when I found myself googling stuff that I was, you know, that started to scare me. I was thinking to myself, shouldn't be feeling this, and there's no one, you know, I couldn't really talk to Bodge how I was feeling because I was there in the dark on my own in the nursery, you know, trying to wind her, trying to feed her, trying to get her off to sleep. And you do your thoughts run away with you, and those can be some of the darkest moments, I think, yeah. at that time, which is why it's so important to communicate with whoever that may be who's there to support you, like your partner, a friend, a family member, a carer, a health visitor, a GP. You've got to communicate. And I found it but so hard to do that. I think even just hearing like us talk about it, I think if I had heard people talking about those thoughts and those darker times before I was going through it, I think even that would have helped mm. in some way mm -hmm. because when you when you're going through it and you haven't heard of other people going through it it feels like you're the only one yeah I think now about when my mum had a baby and how little information there was out there apart from I mean she would have had books and stuff but yeah like and she stayed in hospital for a week after each baby so the midwives could help her but I look at how connected we are now to resources and mm. how we can find things out at the drop of a hat with the internet and stuff like that but I remember this woman Kate who I, I, I fostered a dog and I ended up finding this dog a new home with this lady who I've kept in touch with she's wonderful and um, she messaged me and said I wish I'd had someone like you talking to me when I was in the newborn days because I felt exactly the same as you but I felt like I couldn't ever tell anyone how I was feeling because I felt guilty and I think you know even though I am brutally honest about how hard it was in the beginning and how much I had feelings of regret and anxiety and you know like I just felt awful but like I just think how lucky we are to be able to help people now via Instagram, social yeah. media and stuff like that. Even, you know, we're more connected as friends. We can talk online, which is sometimes a bit easier for people than talking face to face, you know? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I got a few messages from friends after I was open on Instagram about how difficult I was finding it on stories saying, oh, I felt like that. One of my best mates said, I felt like that with my first. And I said to her, you didn't tell me that. And she said, well, it's because all the other girls in our group were kind of nailing it and didn't, didn't say they felt like that. So I felt like I couldn't really be honest about how I was feeling. But yeah. now, but she felt like she could be honest with me, which was something, but, you know, I wish not everybody felt so guilty about it, but you do. There's huge, you know, mum guilt, every aspect yeah. of the way from the moment you fall pregnant to the moment your child, I mean, forever, right? It never yeah, ends. Yeah, yeah. But I just think, yeah, back to, you know, times where women didn't have that kind of like, you know, I was on Peanut the other day, that app. That, mm. you know, I think that's great that you can connect. I, and I was just looking at some women in my area saying, I really would love to meet women in my area for advice. These are women that might not even have a partner or family nearby. And that's what's great about that app. Yeah. Uh, not an ad, not a spawn, by the way. I just, I just genuinely like yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. And because well, I think before COVID, lots of people would meet through NCT classes. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, I'm sure those are still going on, but people are a bit more hesitant in doing it. And I think mm -hmm. when there are things like that, in, in the absence of baby clubs and things, mm -hmm. or people might not feel comfortable going to yeah. baby clubs, I think something like Peanut is great for connecting yeah. connecting parents. But yeah, yeah. And so we're, we're lucky in a way that we, you know, live in a world where we are more connected. But at the same time, it shouldn't make you think, oh, well, I can't, I feel, I feel bad for feeling like that because yeah. I do have so many people around me. And what everyone says to you so often, everything is a phase. Yeah. And 
You know, you'll be like high-fiving your partner going, we had a good night's sleep last night. We've cracked this. And then the next <laughs> night, you'll be up all night. So you just got to take the wins, take the small wins. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you could write a letter on motherhood, who would it be to and what would you say? Well, I guess the book in, a book in many ways is a letter it to is, yeah. all the mums out there who have been through it or who are pregnant and who might go through it. I don't, sometimes I think people might, accused me of scaring women because it's not you know I don't want to say it's all doom and gloom I just wanted to get it out there that it's a possibility that you might find it hard yeah so I guess the book in many ways is a letter to all the mums out there who've been through it but I probably write a letter to my younger self to say don't let anyone make you feel bad about the decisions you're making yeah because I think so often we're judged about our decisions and whether or not we are going to start a family or whether we want kids or not, you know, you shouldn't ever be made to feel bad about your life choices. Yeah. And I probably, yeah, I probably write a letter to my younger self just saying stick to your guns and actually do everything you're going to do and don't question it. Because I'm really glad that I waited this long because I got everything out of my system. And only now do I realise how full on and time consuming and all encompassing being a mum is. Yeah. And I'm really glad I I have my 20s to party and I have my 30s to focus on my career and now I can really focus on being a mum and taking some more time off work actually which I'm about to do Are to, you? to be yeah to be with Noah and to just appreciate this time I have with her because I know I'm never going to do this again G like I'm mm -hmm. I'm definitely done like I don't want any more kids uh, I really want just to focus on Noah and I want to enjoy this time I have with her because I won't ever get these days again with any other child and I won't get them with her you know she's going to yeah. go to nursery soon then she'll go to school and then she'll flee the nest um the final three sentences that I would like you to complete all right you ready <laughs> um being a mum means being a mum means you are blessed but you rarely get a rest Oh, I like that. I made that, that rhyme. <laughs> I think I said that right. Yeah. <laughs> I do feel blessed, but I rarely get a rest and I'm bloody exhausted all the time. <laughs> but I feel so, I do. I feel so blessed that I've been able to have Noah. Yeah. Since having a, a child, I? Since having a child, I still haven't got around to cleaning the skylight windows in the loft bedroom that I've been meaning to do since September 2019 when we moved into this house. <laughs> and I'm happy when? Oh, I'm happy when Noah wakes up. Honestly, you want them to sleep, but you miss them when they're asleep. Yeah. And honestly, when I walk into her nursery first thing in the morning and she sees me, she's so happy to see me. And she's so happy to show me everything on her wall. And oh. I just, I love her so much. And, you know, I've got some hate before saying, oh, she doesn't love her kid. She's always moaning about her kid. I'm just being honest. But that... Make no mistake, I love her to pieces. She is my world. And I'm happy when I see her. And actually, I'll tell you when I'm happy as well. Every morning, we've got a little routine. Sorry to ramble. But I go downstairs, I make her a bottle, I make Bodger coffee, and I make myself a coffee. And I bring our hot drinks up. And we bring her into the bed. And we sit her in between us, and we all have our hot drinks. And Baxter and Shirley are on the bed. And I just love that 10 minutes of calm before the day begins when we're all having our little drinks and she's just, she's got hair everywhere. <laughs> Scarecrow hair, we call her. And I just, I love that time of day where we're just all waking up together. I love I that. really appreciate, especially now, I appreciate it more than ever to have them here and to have a roof over our heads, to have our freedom. Kate, thank you so much. Thank you, G. Thanks for always being there. You're a star. I love the podcast. Thank you for having oh, me. I really thank appreciate you very it. Much. Thank you. Good luck with the book. Thank you.